So we talked about, um, I think we got to all of your films and we managed to get in Volcano mm -hmm. Club and we talked about mental health, mm -hmm. and which I could talk about all day with you. <laughs> um, this yeah. is fine. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, you were basically kind of like the John Dennis in Bend, Oregon. Would you say is that kind of a good... I don't know. I mean, you were teaching acting at the community college. You you started the actors realm, mm -hmm. and then you kind of put on your business hat and did the volcanic theater works um, with your architect friend who helped you build that. Um, and then, but now it's like, you know, you're kind of tired of of the entrepreneur hat, and you want to go back and do the more go, kind of go back to doing what I guess. You know. Well, yeah, I, <clears throat> so. my, I think if you go as far back as uh, as a teenager to now in my mid-50s, the one constant theme for me is I create. That's, that's who I am. Um, I often ask, where do you come up with that shit? I'm like, well, that's the internal question, right? I mean, I don't know. It just comes out. What else would you um, <laughs> Yeah. It's what I do. Yeah. And it's what my brain does. Now, whether bipolar disorder has anything to do with it, I, I don't know and don't care. Um, I, love the, I, I love how David Lynch describes it. <clears throat> He describes creativity because I I so when he when he when he said it I went I understand that dude. Hmm. Um, he said, and I and I, I do I I do meditate. Uh, I have to, but <clears throat> he talks about transcendental meditation a lot. He has a uh, actually a film school that focuses main focuses on writing and transcendental meditation. Um, but he, he said ideas, and he's he's very visual, probably much more visual than I am in his approach. Um, but he, he, he'll start he'll with, with, with pictures. He'll see something. And he, and he talks about, for me, it's vocal. I'll be driving around on my motorcycle or in my Jeep. I, I don't have radio on. I don't have music on. I daydream. I allow out things to just come out. And I talk to myself a lot. And that's some oftentimes where a piece of dialogue could start an idea. And Lynch describes it as there's an idea. It's not a story. But it's an idea. But it's a little bitty one. But that, throw that one in, it's like fishing. And that fish is going to catch a bigger fish. Throw that one in, and that's going to catch a bigger fish. And the fish keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you finally have a story. And <clears throat> you don't know, again, where they come from originally or even how they evolved. Sometimes it's just sitting down and writing and things just start flowing and, and coming to you. Other times, David Mamet describes writing, uh, which is also, I'm like, I understand that. He says, uh, when you're writing, uh, you have an idea and all of a sudden you get stuck. And I always get stuck. I'm like, what do I do now? And he goes, you're going to get stuck. But here's the great thing about it. You are going to find a way out of it. Because mm -hmm. the character's got to find a way out of it. And you're going to find a way out of it. But here's the great thing about it. The audience is going to get stuck too. And they're going to wonder, how the hell is they going to get out of it? I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. It's 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 not only normal, it's beneficial for the story. 
because it moves the audience to go, what's he going to do now? How's he going to get out of this mess? Yeah. So I love the idea of how um, how similar many artists are in their creation, and then also how different we are because of where we come from. Like my stories usually. Um, uh, if you have a recurring voice in it, you know, they are broken, damaged people and usually rural America. And <clears throat> if you look at Mammoth, almost always Chicago. Uh, Shepard, he loved the West. Uh, Steinbeck loved the Dust Bowl Oakey area like Bakersfield and Visalia and up and towards uh, Northern California. They had specific voices and recurring themes. And it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. It's like, oh, it's like I love, I, I, I hope to someday capture this. Um, but I love seeing an image from a film. Have you ever seen, uh, played the game Framed? No. It's very similar to um, Wordle. Every night, Framed puts up an image. Hmm. Screenshot. And you get six guesses. What film that is. Oh. Some you go, boom, you know what that is. Some are so obscure, you're like, what? that could be anything. I don't know what that is. Maybe I haven't even seen it. But what I do love is when I see a trailer or an image from a film, I can identify that director right away. Like, you, you only need one image to know a Wes Anderson film. It's just, it's Wes Anderson. Like, I know who that is. Again, becomes more of a cinematic motion picture visual experience. Uh, sometimes you 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 know what a Scorsese film is. Many people try to like when they did Joker with um, Joaquin Phoenix. Right. They try to replicate tra Taxi Driver because the overall feeling of being in New York is so vibrant in, in Taxi Driver. You know, you always know you're in New York in a Scorsese film. Sure. Differently than Woody Allen in New, in Manhattan. It's a different New York. Yeah. Spike yeah. Lee, Tim Burton. Immediate. You know it's a Tim Burton film in one image. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever be that visually minded as a director. Um, might be uh, more like a Darren Aronofsky who is more of a character-driven <clears throat> film director that, yeah. uh, you know, Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan, The Wrestler, yeah. uh, The Whale, yeah. uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, I have to say this, there's a, uh, <clears throat> do you remember American Playhouse? was a television program. It was similar to Masterpiece Theater. American Playhouse <clears throat> would have these Broadway shows, but they would go on set with their video cameras and shoot and edit and piece together the play and put it on TV. Well, they did, now I was already a big fan of Steppenwolf at this time, um, but they had had a production of True West, the original, with Malkovich and Sinise. Sinise directed and also played Austin, and Malkovich played Lee. And nobody knew who either one of these guys were, but they showed up on Broadway. And then Malkovich was instant stardom. Malkovich had never auditioned for a role in his life. Hmm. True West just catapulted him into 
stratospheric star from that one performance. I watched that so many times that it probably could have ruined my career because I found it as an acting Bible because the way they approached it. And I tried to share copies of this VHS tape to everybody I ran into. You have to watch this because Malkovich is brilliant. He's stunning. The performance is a little self-indulgent. But um, that approach, that American Playhouse production of shooting a play, like, oh, I want to do that. I think where that's where everything started for me is, oh, you can definitely write a play and shoot it. A lot of people adapt, many, many, many people adapt. Uh, plays into film. Another Steppenwolf actor, Tracy Latz, who's from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. his plays are all adapted into film. Uh, there's August Osage County, because he's a Steppenwolf, and he wrote that specifically for the cast of actors they had at Steppenwolf. He wrote it for that. He wrote Bug, uh, if you've seen that, with... Uh, Oh, uh, what's the girl's? Uh, uh, oh. I, I love her. Um, oh, she'll come to me in a minute. Um, but uh, John, John Patrick Shanley, also a playwright that I absolutely adore, his films like Doubt, A Parable with Meryl Streep and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, when you look at the their character driven dramas with you know limited locations i'm like oh this is ex precisely what i want to do yeah and that's probably what i'll continue to do uh but utilizing my own imagination and my own visuals i see in my head and and always being character driven and always uh focusing uh on story. And for me, story is always, and for me, I always break it down, even to my students, to five things. And <clears throat> it starts with character. Number one, always character, character. What does he want? What does he want? One person wants one thing. Start there. There's your story. That's your plot, too. Their journey of getting what they want. It, it's fundamentally, it's pretty simple. Executing, not so easy, but pretty simple then you have obstacles in their way that's drama that's conflict that's what tells the story then you have stakes how well, what happens if they get or don't get what they want that's that creates suspense that creates the, the intensity and it then creates uh, it, um, the vitality of what's happening in the story um any good story and then then you have your um how they get what they want it reveals the type of person and type of character they are it reveals can reveal a whole biography of who these people were and who their parents were and and then Finally, it's commitment, personalize it, mean it. If you start there with those five things, you can tell a good story. You got to be passionate about it. And I think all the great voices of uh, American uh, film directors and the great writers and the great playwrights, great theater directors, almost all of them move into film. I, I can't think of I can't think of any that haven't. I mean, Shepard, Sam Shepard did it. Oh, Martin McDonough has done it very successfully. Um, Albie, I mean, who, who's afraid of Jenny Wolf, is an enormous cinematic uh, film. Hmm. Um, so that's probably going to be a through line.
for me is shooting that way. Film students learn something completely different. They 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 approach with they learn uh, camera technique, which lenses to use. You know, uh, it's it's a completely different process than an actor's approach. So when you see an actor directing, um, even if they're directing themselves, like you know um, Gary Sinise. He directed him and Malkovich in Of Mice and Men. And it's a fantastic film. Yeah. And of course, you have Clint Eastwood who does, you know, a movie every year. Um, <clears throat> Spike Lee's in a lot of his own movies. Um, but I think that experience as an actor and studying scripts and dissecting plays and dissecting characters gave me the opportunity and knowledge to actually have confidence to sit down and write something and be heavily influenced by people but also have my own voice and understanding that this is what I'm going to write like sometimes John would question in Black Tussle like what is this what is this I don't know what this line means I don't know what this means I'm like well He's intoxicated, John. I mean, how many times have you seen somebody intoxicated that just all of a sudden just goes off on something? It's like, where are you? And I had to explain. It's like, why does everybody have to be so mean? Oh, yeah. You can't trust nobody. He goes, where does that come from? I'm like, because John, he just realized he's been screwed over and he's in, he's intoxicated again. And I said, just take a deep breath and tell the universe that, and he took the note and that's when you see him up to the, the gods. Gosh, yeah. Why does everybody have to be so mean? So being a writer and having the confidence as a writer is growing, but again, still always heavily, heavily, heavily influenced yeah. by playwrights and Pulitzer prize-winning playwrights that are damn good at what they do yeah. that that would be always my goal to be a gary sinise to be a you know a mark mcdonough and mark mcdonough's interesting story his plays you know i've done several of them <clears throat> his first film was in bruges with uh colin farrell mm -hmm. um same cast that's in banshees of Inna sharon but he based that story on The Dumbwaiter by Harold Pinner, which I'd also done. So it's always fascinating to me to find out where these people get their ideas, their influences. And I'm like, oh, th th we're, we're not all that different, really. Yeah. We're, we, our, our processes and how we get there are different. But the, the, the creation, when you are an artist, when you are a creator, you know, I think everyone has something in common. Process is probably a little different, but our, in, how we're influenced, it's, that's such a big deal though, how we're influenced. Yeah, yeah. Our childhoods, um, the people we ran around with, you know, the, the people we dated, the people, uh, that that shaped uh, our adolescence and then into our teenage years and then into college and then into adulthood and marriage and having children. I mean, all these things shape us who we are in addition to, you know, your struggles and your triumphs. And and I think I think we always go back to our roots. Yeah. It's interesting to me. Yeah. And we've done, I've done Banshees hmm. back in Ireland where he's from. And I think it's his best film. And we all, he's, he's always going to go back there and he should. And Sam Shepard always wrote about his dad. It was such a profound thing for him in every play. He mentions his dad 
and he may always mentions him not being there. Hmm. So would you, would you ever go back to Oklahoma? <laughs> um, see my mom. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. I mean, I um, <clears throat> I love where I'm from. I embraced being an Okie. I love a lot of people there. Um, my childhood was 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 good. Um, it I found out was much different than people that once I got to college and understood that people actually got along with each other, <laughs> that families weren't always angry at each other. Um, families, there were like my wife's parents for some, I'm like, oh my God, it's Ozzie and Harriet. Mm -hmm. I didn't know these people existed. Um, it's it's a different culture for sure. But I, lo I love the fact that that's, that's where I'm from, but it, uh, there, there just wouldn't be a great deal of opportunity there for me. Um, I love my mom, and yeah. there's a lot of people there that uh, friends, you know, you went to school with, and I don't, st I'm not real close with any of them. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'd go to visit. And I'd love to see a lot of people, but no, I don't. I, I certainly wouldn't live there. Yeah, not to live there. Yeah. No. Yeah get that i mean it's 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 just it's it's complicated like yeah <laughs> i'd go back to louisiana before i go to oklahoma because okay. it's southern louisiana is culturally rich i mean it's yeah. it's it's yeah. there's a lot going on oh yeah um because we i i i haven't we haven't talked about it but in, in, when i went to uh when I decided to go to grad school, I had lots of options actually, but um, I chose LSU because I one of uh, John Dennis, and because of the culture, uh, I was fascinated with New Orleans and and, and Southern Louisiana mm -hmm. much more than the other places. Uh, but I wanted to. experience that um, vibrant, swampy, yeah. bluesy, interesting, trio, Cajun. I, I just wanted to dive into it. So I was <clears throat> first semester, first play, main stage, I was the lead, and I I don't know how I did so many plays at LSU. Okay. I I was I was actually going from a main stage production into a rehearsal for a black box production. Then after that, I was going to band rehearsal or to a gig, and I did that for three years. I was so in addition to the classes. I was in play rehearsals almost every night or in production almost every night and then going to a black box production and then going to band rehearsal and then also teaching advanced acting uh, to undergrads. So um, I was so busy in three years there. I, I did so much that I, I look back on it once I was diagnosed with bipolar and after people were making comments about me mm. in graduate school, everything made sense. I'm like, of course I did it. Okay. Of course I double majored in undergrad because I had the energy to do it. I was doing five plays a, a year and double majoring of course I did it. I had the energy. He's like, oh, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, just do it. You look back on it and go, oh, I was manic. 
course. Yeah. In your 20s, your body can handle it. Hmm. You could just go. And you had a lot of, I, I had the innate ability before even the training um, to believe those circumstances very quickly. Realism was came easy to me quickly. The other stuff wasn't so easy for me. But you give me Sam Shepard, Mamet, Tennessee Williams, you know, I, oh, I'm oh, I'm in there. You give me Shakespeare, I'm like, okay, what the what is this? Okay. Wait, 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 I don't know what this is. Huh. Um, I remember Barry Kyle telling me I was doing a uh, Hamlet. And he said something. Eventually, it made sense. He goes, Derek, you are, I feel, therefore I am. He said, you're like, you get on an emotional uh, surfboard. And you once you hit that emotion, you just start riding it. We have to go, Derek, Derek, Hamlet's over here. And you go, okay. And you start riding it over there. And everything was just guttural and visceral and everything had to be that and he said not everything is method acting Derek I'm like yeah it is so you played for Hamlet in the play it was no it was uh, 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 scene work oh okay in class uh, from and Barry that Barry was teaching um, and it was an old wild rogue speech and it was, but, and even, even JD said something to me once we were doing Chekhov and uh, I was playing Trigorin, the seagull. And all of a sudden I was, uh, you know, I, I just started banging my head on the table oh. and I was, I was there and he stopped. Derek, what, what are you doing? I don't know. I'm upset. And he's, he just shakes his head. Derek, not every character is from Oklahoma. And I thought he was talking about my accent. Oh, oh, okay. Later on, I realized, oh, this is turn of the century Russia. People just don't randomly go around banging their head on stuff. This is a different culture. So the the experience at LSU, not only did JD is so insightful and recognized who I was very quickly, American realism came easy to me, where the other stuff was quite the struggle yeah. because I, I had to believe it and, and feel it. Pretend was no, no, didn't work for me. Technique okay. didn't work for me. Because I felt if you could passionately thrust yourself into an objective, all the other elements of the acting craft fall into place. You'll be heard. You'll know where to go. Your blocking will be taken care of. Everything's done. That's how I work. And to this day, that's still how I work. Because it, it's where I'm the most effective as an actor and probably as a writer and a director. The the other stuff they talked about epic theater and like you know I, I didn't find any use in it. Because Barry and JD could not be any more different. And when Barry cast me in the first uh, big main stage production and I was playing a Nazi. SS officer. But it was completely different work. And I didn't understand I didn't understand it. I do I do now, yeah. of course. But at that time everything was just outrageous and intense and dysfunctional and broken and just and I'm still I still deal with those people. But I understood that not everybody's from 
small town Oklahoma, and not every play or character is written that he, because J.D. said, I'd like once for you to play a bank teller because I'd like to see you play somebody where there's not something wrong with them. I said, I don't know how to do that. And I don't know why I would. So that was the, that's where it all started. I play broken people. I write about broken people. Broken people. Damaged, outrageous circumstances that to me aren't that outrageous. Yeah. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I know those people. You, you play like your your thing is the broken people who who are broken. Like they're not they're not hiding it. They're not. I don't know. Is that is that what you mean? They're visibly, yeah. noticeably broken, broken, damaged, and um. Like you know, every character is different. I mean, it's some. I'm much more subtle about it. Like with Chekhov, some are much more. Yeah. Like with Chekhov, it's like the characters are like there's like a repression. Is that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's there. It's I mean, there, there. People forget that they are comedies. Yeah. And the repressed and the depressed of these these characters in these worlds you 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 have discovered Chekhov and once you've realized Chekhov same with Shakespeare once you and I did I learned about Shakespeare there is once you learn the brilliance the genius of Shakespeare and trust the meter and trust the rhythm What happens to you internally is is written in the music of the rhythm of the meter. So you just trust it and it'll take you there. You don't have to, you know, dive into it like you're doing uh, <clears throat> Tennessee Williams. You you trust the meter. Um check off is the same thing as you you have to trust turn of the century Russia uh, at that time and understand that this is how these people behaved and silent dysfunction is much more difficult to portray than the outrageous dysfunction but once you learn how to do it like I was doing a main stage play called Mad Forest at LSU <clears throat> and one of the scenes the director said I don't want you to move I said what mm -hmm. don't don't move just stay still standing the entire scene I'm like no because that's not who I was I, I've never done that before in my life I, I'm not what and I did it and it felt uncomfortable as hell. Mm. And I kept doing it. I'll send you a picture. It was me uh, and Sean Bridgers. Sean Bridgers from uh, Deadwood. Right. Do you know Deadwood? No. Um, <clears throat> so Sean's had a pretty successful uh, uh, film television career. And we did quite a few plays together. And um, anyway, what I learned was if you take all the energy that I had and focused it and just stood still and put every single ounce of it into your objective, it be, actually became more powerful than somebody that was more kinetic and 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 JD taught me that, particularly for, for film, that that's why you see a performance like Tutu Grande, where he's very, appears to be very grounded. Yeah. But he's 
very, very dangerous. Yes. Because of the stillness. Unlike Koi, oh. who's complete opposite. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, and you when you learn when you learn those techniques, um, and different circumstances, different characters, uh, it it, and when you're writing not just for yourself but for other characters you've got to really put your mind and go okay mm. this is not how i would do it because this is a completely different character probably one i'm not going to play and then you have to write that down with the same energy and stillness and understand that how the performance is going to go so like in bug tussle <clears throat> originally didn't know who's going to be crow or Coyote. I, I, I didn't have it cast and probably was going to play uh, Crow. Um, when then John said to me, I like put my head in if you ever do this for Crow. But then it came to a time like, you know what, guys, let's shoot this thing. And I just called up John and said, hey, you want to do this? Yeah, well, this is when we're doing it. Can you do it? Yeah, all right. And I called up Taylor, said this is when we're going to do it, where we're going to do it, let's do it. And by God, I'll, I'll, just, I'll play Coyote because it's during a pandemic. The fewer people we have on set, the better. And there were six of us, three cast members, three crew members. That was it, one day. And <clears throat> playing Coyote with John was uh, uh, a whole lot of fun because Coyote's a uh, he's he's unhinged. He's 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 in a spectrum too. There's 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 a lot going on with that guy. Oh, you you had the best costume in the movie, that's for sure. <laughs> took me forever to find that shirt. Took me forever to find that shirt. Uh, it was it was actually a women's shirt. Oh. Uh, um, and I had to wear, you know, really a lot of weight, wore really baggy clothes to make me appear even smaller. Because um, mm. I want him to be that little wiry, little, you know, almost meth addicted, little, you know, kind of uh, yeah. unhinged guy that might just pop off at any moment. Uh, and innocent and childlike. Not Lenny. Yeah. To say but still simple, innocent, childlike, yet dangerous. And mm -hmm. that's that was kind of the goal with okay. with Coyote. And to 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 you know understand him and he you know he, he's kind of funny too, you know, he's yeah, we... and the, the script was written to be, you know, um uh, I don't say a comedy for sure, but uh, uh, it was written that the circumstance is pretty outrageous. A comedy, yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's absurd. <laughs> Beverly Hills is an hour and a half down the road, guys. Just FYI. Yeah. It's not that long of a drive. But yeah. for them, and I understood this, it's like when I grew up, people going to Tulsa was a major life decision i'm like just go it's 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 80 miles but for that for those people with you know in poverty well, that dream of just going to hollywood or beverly hills was a major major obstacle and a major risk for them and for a lot of people, seem impossible. Yeah. This is the end of our interview. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>